the most memorable images of the Gospels captured in one of the most memorable quotes is that of a very tired, very human Jesus, worn out, perhaps even a bit burnt out after a long day of teaching, preaching, and helping others. His colleagues were trying to protect him, so they turned away this one final last group, seeking an audience with him, a group of little children. But Jesus had other plans, and he directed his handlers to suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. He knew their importance, and we do in our day and our time here in our community. We know that children represent the future, our future, the future engineers creating new technologies, doctors discovering cures, scientists unlocking mysteries, artists, writers, architects, all helping to build a beautiful and hopefully peaceful and prosperous new world. Yet today, also in our time, at our own border, we had a very different reaction to the group of children who were coming to us for help, for healing, for our blessing. We did not say, as Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. But rather, when they came, our government said, let the little children suffer. We recall the searing images of kids in cages, children of tender years taken from their mother's arms, Families intentionally separated as a punishment for exercising a legal right to request asylum, safety in the United States. While those visceral images fade, we must remember that family separation takes many forms and happens every day in our community to our neighbors. Every day, moms and dads of US citizen children face deportation in our immigration courts most without the benefit of legal representation. And though federal courts have slowed attempts to end programs for numerous immigrant groups, such as DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and for Temporary Protected Status, which provides safety currently to over 1 million of our neighbors here in the United States, many in South Florida. Collectively, these individuals in those various programs have 500,000 US citizen children and they will face deportation if these programs end. So daily, even during the pandemic, the diverse and multilingual staff, a very committed group of individuals at CLS, Catholic Legal Services, endeavor to keep these families together. At times they are weary, frustrated, a bit burnt out. They are the Jesus in the gospel, tired, but they never fail to say, suffer the little children to come unto me. And tonight is about helping them help keep families together in our community, our neighbors. It is my distinct honor to turn this over now to a professional, to a person uniquely qualified to lead us into a deeper discussion of the issues and the ways we all can help. Pamela Conde came to the U.S. herself as a child from Peru. As an example of the future potential of children I had mentioned earlier, Pamela has risen to the top of her profession. A celebrated journalist, six-time Emmy Award winner, co-anchor of the Univision Network's weekday news magazine, Premier Impacto, one of the highest rated programs in the United States and in 12 Latin American countries. She has been recognized by People in Español as one of the 25 most powerful Hispanic women. And that is just one among many accolades and honors. Her outstanding work in the field of journalism has contributed richly to our national discourse. Her visibility as a successful Latina serves as an inspiration and a role model for young women of all races and all ethnicities. Her philanthropy, particularly her dedication to children's causes, has enhanced the life of countless young people. Her career and her own life's journey so clearly embody the words of Harry Truman, 
America was not built on fear. America was built on courage, on imagination, and unbeatable determination to do the job at hand. So I thank you, Pamela, for joining us today to do the job at hand. <laughs> thank you, Randy. Thank you so much. Um, it's going to be a great evening. I'm so excited. And as you mentioned, this is a cause, a human um, cause that has really touched us on a, not only on a personal basis, but also on a professional basis. And unfortunately, we've have, had to report on the children and the separation of families way too many times in the last year. So we're trying to do something about it. And this is a great way to do something about it and to join an effort um, on behalf of Catholic Legal Services. And we have a great program uh, put together for all of you joining us today and for all of you watching this video. Uh, we have a great set of guests that will be joining us. And let me go ahead and review a little bit of what we, is gonna be going on in the next in the next hour. So we're gonna have the world-renowned celebrity pastry chef, Anthony Bashir, who's also gonna be sharing his personal journey um, as a family of refugees as well, and his successful story as well. We also have Alexandra Godina, who is the award-winning documentary filmmaker, a great friend of mine who really has motivated me to do more about these children and these families, and that's why I'm here tonight as well. We're also gonna have um, Garcia Cousy, who's a supervising attorney for Catholic Legal Services. Um, and I always say this is one of those anonymous heroes behind the scenes who's changing lives and saving these children from being separated. And we'll go, we're gonna go ahead and hear about her uh, mission and the type of work that she's doing along with her team. And we're also gonna hear hopefully from Fernando who is the protagonist. So Ali um, produced and directed this documentary called um, Paper Children or Los Niños de Papel. And she documented the, the journey of this family that, and, and I don't wanna give anything away and we'll get to hear about from her, but it really, humanize this issue in the not only the border but everything every time a child has to leave her home country because they fear for their life so it's going to be really fascinating to hear from her and to hear how not only the documentary changed her but also how she's doing more about the, the issue as a whole after the documentary so why don't we get started with what first guest and i'm going to go ahead and ask antonio for sure to join us now he's not only going to be sharing his personal story but also has a great treat for us, and he's gonna go ahead and explain what he's gonna be sharing with us today. Um, I think he's pre pre preparing his tart, a pumpkin tart. And we wanted to do something visual for all of you to enjoy. Um, and it is a great privilege to have him join us tonight because he is world renowned, and I was um, a huge fan of his. But he also has a fascinating story, a story of um, success, but of hard work, and, and also of great admiration for the sacrifices that his family made in order for him to be where he is right now. Hi, Antonio. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Pamela. How are you? Good. So why don't we first explain what we're going to be doing on the table, and then we'll go ahead and start asking you questions about your journey and your family and the importance and why these refugee stories and these family separation has really touched your heart in a very, very special way. Of course, uh, today, uh, tonight we're gonna make a pumpkin tart to celebrate in few weeks, uh, Thanksgiving days. Uh, I will explain a little bit about my family. Uh, they came from Lebanon, from the refugee uh, to Puerto Rico, and then uh, a little bit about me. Go ahead, Antonio, get started. Okay, uh, like uh, most of the people know, my, my parents, they are from Lebanon. They emigrate from Lebanon to Brazil and then to Puerto Rico, they move. Uh, for many reasons, for the civil war, for the many problems, cultural problems. And then we grew up in a family uh, in Puerto Rico in the 60s, uh, in the 70s. Uh, people, they look at my family like an immigrant, like uh, they, they bully us, they, they say Arabic people, Turkish people. But with everything like that, we grew up with a great value, Catholic family, and then my parent was a great uh, hard worker. He came to, to Puerto Rico to, to make uh, our life much better. Um, and he, he showed us the right way to, to go ahead uh, and being a good person. And this is your way of helping tonight, Anthony, joining us and showing us this wonderful treat. Why is it important to you 
um, to give back to the community, especially to, to the refugee families and help those children uh, with these, you know, with Catholic legal services. Yeah, uh, I hope everybody can sponsor and support the Catholic service, uh, legal service, because uh, in my personal uh, experience, I work in many kitchen, uh, kitchen in New York, in, in, in LA, and most of the workers, they are immigrants. A lot of refugees from uh, South America, Central America, Mexico, Ecuador, and they are hard worker people, good people with a good heart. Uh, I hope everybody can help uh, these people. They, they stay in United state. They, they came here for uh, one reason, to, to be a dreamer, to believe in the freedom, in, in work, in, with great value, and then we need to support these people. What was the advice that your father gave you, Antonio, when, when your family was being bullied, when you felt an, an anti-immigrant sentiment what was the advice he gave you so that you guys stay focused on hard work and, the, and on the family values? You know, the, the advice uh, my parents and my father always say that always, uh, come, if you are in this country, you need to work hard. You need to be a great person. You need to, to show the people that we are one of them. You know, my father always said, you need to be one of them. You need to work hard. You need to be somebody that people respect you. Uh, and doing the right thing, uh, go to the school, educate, work hard. And that's the, 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 the story of success of my family. And it's definitely worked. Um, we're right now, tell us where you are right now because I, this is one of my favorite kitchens here in Miami. Yeah, I, I'm here in, in, in my kitchen in Bashur, Miami. Uh, this is my restaurant. Uh, we wanna make a little bit uh, a tart for Thanksgiving. This is the tart shirt we make with almond. Start. We want to have some uh, dulce de leche, of course, something Latin to the, like a twist, Latin twist to the, our to, uh, pumpkin tart. Mm. We have the dulce de leche on the bottom of the tart. We want to have some pumpkin cream that we make with fresh pumpkin. Now, let me remind everyone that in 2018, Antonio was awarded the Best Pastry Chef Award by the prestigious Best Chefs Awards Organization, which is the world's leading culinary award platform. So this is not, this is a very special technique that we're watching here. Yeah, we have, uh, we have the, the pumpkin cream on top of the dulce de leche, and then we wanna add on the top, like a cinnamon, cream, we freeze them in the mold and we put on top and we wanna decorate with some chocolate decoration that we make in my shop with a, like a maple leaf in different chocolate shape. You know, we need to celebrate uh, like we are in, in a freedom place in a in United States with a country that everybody deserves a place to work and enjoy. That's right, Antonio. That's the irony of it. You know, Thanksgiving, which is where most families get together and celebrating with your loved ones. A lot of these children are so not are so separated from their loved ones and their families. So I think in honor of them, that's another reason why we're joining forces with Catholic legal services. As many of you know, a lot of and it's a complicated legal system. It's a complicated journey emotionally and also from a legal perspective. And this is why it's important um, to help organizations like Catholic legal services. Um, that looks beautiful and it looks delicious. I'm gonna have to go pass by personally and yes. do those. But thank you so much and for joining us, for sharing your story, for your generosity, for your time. And just for inspiring everyone, right? To help those who need the help, especially during these times. And, and this is a great cause. So thank you for sharing your art with us oh, tonight. Thank everybody. you. Um, I hope everybody support uh, Catholic Legal Service. Uh, let's uh, support all the immigrants in the United States. Uh, we hope everybody enjoy tonight. Thank you so much, Antonio. Th thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to go ahead and continue our program. And uh, joining us in this uh, virtual event is Alexandra Codina. Alexandra Codina, like I mentioned before, is a dear friend, but she's also an award-winning director and producer. 
and she has made it her personal um, to tell the stories and to advocate for these families and these children. She recently produced and directed Paper Children. Um, and before we get to see a little trailer of that documentary, let's go ahead and welcome Ali. Hi, Ali. Hi. I think you guys just caught a glimpse of my children. <laughs> I know we're all multitasking tonight, but also, you know, very devoted to this cause. Um, I love the idea. Can you tell a little bit about how we put together this concept to help Catholic Legal Services? What was it important to you um, to support this cause? Well, first of all, thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Antonio. This is already so much fun and it's such a different way, I think, to engage everyone. Um, as someone who not only made a film about this family and, and you know, the the broader, who represents not only this community of, of so many immigrants in our country who've come here seeking protection, seeking safety, I mean, some very, to meet very basic needs. Um, but also, as you know, I was drawn to making this film as a mother, as a mother who was very heartbroken when I started hearing these stories about why these children were fleeing Central America and how un-American uh, and how harsh and, and unforgiving our response was when they arrived on our borders seeking that protection that you were talking about before, Pamela. So for me, tonight is about encouraging all of us to see beyond the politics, to really see the human side of this issue. Of course, it's prep for Give Miami Day, so we all really want to help raise funds because I have observed firsthand just how fundamental the role of a lawyer is in the life of a child, and also, of course, the life of, of any immigrant, be them an adult, a family unit, or, or a, a young and vulnerable child. But what Catholic Legal Services does is so vital in our community, and, and at a level where I think most people don't realize because they do their job so well, which is providing either pro bono services, or um, in the case of the kids, it's all pro bono, and then for any other member of the immigrant community who they provide services to, it's all low cost. And as we know, it's a community that's predominantly very low income. And for you, Catholic Services also has a very special place in your heart because it really is coming full circle for you. And tell us a little bit about your father's story and why, um, how everything connected now. Thank you, Pamela, for, uh, for reminding me of, you know, it's funny because I, I did originally start reading about these stories and I had a newborn and I had a toddler and I couldn't get through this 20 page report for several days. And it was just because the idea of being in that situation either as a mother or imagining even worse my child in those situations was very hard to stomach. Um, but then once I started getting deeper into these stories, it really, as you're saying, reminded me so much of my own father's story. My father arrived in the 60s from Cuba as an unaccompanied child himself through a program called Operation Peter Pan, Pedro Pan. And he went on to become, to embody in many ways, the American dream. And it was not an easy process. It's never an easy process to leave home. Um, and we all have, you know, every human story is a complicated story, but I do know that his success is not only rooted in, in family and it's rooted in an incredible amount of work and, and, and devotion, um, but also the fact that he had that immediate legal protection, which as a child arriving from Cuba in the 60s, he was uniquely afforded. And that's something that most immigrants or very few immigrants, especially, um, you know, these vulnerable children who've been arriving in the last several years and these large numbers from Central America are not afforded. So the difference, the similarities really connected for me, but also the difference from the legal perspective in terms of how my father was embraced versus Fernando and the children right. in this film. And, and so the if you think about it now, and we'll see a little bit more when we see the trailer, is good legal representation, any legal representation in that sense, um, immediately or as soon as they could get it, could make a dramatic difference in the lives of these children and their families. Um, and, and, and we'll see, because it varies so much between case and case, children to children, uh, that it really, I think, makes a huge difference for them to be able to have access to this. And also build a relationship, because I was very impressed with the type of relationship that these children develop with, with their attorneys. You know, we'll, we'll get to speak with one of them in, in a few minutes. 
Um, but what, from your perspective, you know, when, well, you were documented this, and, and let me emphasize that Ali documented this for many years. She followed this family in other cases, um, not for a year, not for months, but for many, many years. So if you could tell us a little bit about that journey and what impressed what you learned from that, you know, about those relationships between attorney and their clients. I think, I think you're right. I think that relationship, not only is it vital for children to receive that protection, and again, we're talking about kids who are fleeing gang violence. They're fleeing some of the most horrific circumstances in this hemisphere, things that a child should never be exposed to. Um, and when I started watching these lawyers, because as you said, I ended up focusing on the one family, and in part, I focused on the family because... Um, you know, you have different ages, you have a, a sister, brothers, a younger one, but also without giving away the ending of the film, they had different outcomes. It's a very subjective system. Mm -hmm. but, um, but what really has struck me the most in terms of the lawyers and the work that they do is not only that you need to have a lawyer who's brilliant and very adept at the most, some of the most complicated law in the United States. A lot of people say that um, immigration law is the equivalent of tax law in terms of its complexity. And then of course, the last few years, things are changing. There have been 900 changes to the immigration system that, that implicate, you know, that, that affect the way the law is practiced. Well, today we have some new developments in that term. So every day you have to be up to date and just aggressively trying to, um, to just, I guess, um, get through the system. Now, why don't we take a look? I don't know, we're ready to play a, a trailer of Paper Children. This is a trailer of the documentary. Salir de la casa de mi abuela, de Honduras, pasamos 12 días viajando para poder llegar aquí a este país. Ese fue el día que nos encontramos con mis padres aquí en Estados Unidos. <laughs> ¿Qué fue lo más difícil de ese camino? Que lo pusiera en una hielera. Le daba con machete y, y pa. Me daba miedo salir. Y nada más salía cuando estaban las luces del campo encendidas. Hay unos hombres rodeando la casa. Dije yo, no abras la puerta. Tienen que buscar un abogado. We get one more chance before it goes to the judge. Right. Miami-Dade County is not a sanctuary community. Que no hay que pensar si si me quedo o no me quedo. Si Dios nos permite, vamos a estar legalmente. Y es el mismo caso porque son hermanos. Pasaron todo lo que pasó uno, pasó el otro. Tengo que orarle a Dios. Yo sé que detrás de los niños están en las manos de él. Anoche cuando no paraba de llorar, ese niño no paraba de llorar. ¿Cómo regresar a Honduras? ¿A morir? Now, Paper Children is available to stream and watch on YouTube. Ali, and let's emphasize this, because I know we discussed this before. Not only is the journey to get here a difficult one, and we see that very, very many times, but the, what makes I think this document so original is that it documents the journey once they're here. And that's when it becomes another challenging obstacle for them, because they have to go through the legal system, because they have to live with that stress and the mental um, stresses that a you know, child should not be dealing with, but that they're constantly living with that fear. Um, let's talk a little bit about that, but why was it important to start documenting once they arrived here? And what did you learn about it throughout, throughout the whole, all those years? Well, Pamela, when I started learning about the issue, I did a lot of reading. I did a lot of observing in immigration court. Um, I did a lot of talking to advocates. I really was just absorbing as much as I could. And especially in the media, um, the mainstream media, but frankly, even in film, and in a lot of news reports that I was reading, everything was about the journey, 
there was a lot in 2014 when I started researching this film, which is 2014, the summer is when the kids in our family arrived. And that summer we had 70,000 children arrive at our border without their parents, specifically fleeing violence in Central America, which is astonishing still to this day to me. And, and, and those numbers have continued to be steadily high, much higher than they had ever been. Um, Oh, and now I forgot the question. What was your? No, why well, was it important to document once they arrived here that legal journey and that mental stress that they have to live with yes. once they arrive in the United States? Totally. Thank you. And so when when I was doing all of this reading and all this research and talking to people, everything was about what happened at the border, the journey, and why people were fleeing. The the condition, the country conditions were, and rightfully so but at a certain point we had to start understanding what happens after these children do arrive in the u.s i mean we have right now half a million children waiting in limbo waiting for some kind of the pro further process to be resolved and I, I i think that one of the strengths in the film is that you really see the trauma the layers of trauma you know you're seeing children begin to heal and process from in, in terms of what they experienced and what they witnessed in the past, while also going through, as you were saying, this very challenging um, process. And it, right now, Fernando arrived in 2014, and again, without revealing the end of the film, he's been in limbo for, for six years now, and that's not unheard of. So, you know, I think people understanding that it's not just about getting to the US, and I think that it also reflects the reality of, um, of a, another process, you know, for a lot of immigrants and particularly children, I think when people talk about, people have some of these assumptions that people come here trying to cheat the system. The truth is every child that I spoke to really didn't have a game plan in terms of how they were gonna pursue some kind of protection here. They just felt that getting to the US was safe. And it was just this very visceral feeling that in their country, their government was doing nothing to protect them. There were these armed groups um, coming after them. And unfortunately, there aren't any countries between Honduras and the US where people can reasonably seek safety. This really, of course, in the case of these children, we also had their parents were here in the US, which is not uncommon. They were here doing a lot of that day labor work, which our economy depends on, frankly. The parents have done day labor work for many, many years since, since they arrived here. So. We're gonna go ahead, Annie, and ask um, Gracia to, to join us. Now, Gracia Cousy is a supervising attorney with Catholic Legal Services and represents, um, of course, siblings here. And let me know, how did you, how did you do to meet Ali? So I actually knew Randy, who we saw earlier, the executive director of Catholic Legal Services, who's, by the way, just a very beloved champion and advocate here in the community. So I knew Randy from many years of work in the community. And when I started the project, I met with him. I also met with um, Cheryl Little, who's the executive director of Americans for Immigrant Justice. And together, these are the two organizations that are really across the board doing the majority of the representation for our immigrant community in South Florida. Um, and specifically when I met with Randy, I have to say he was always so open to introducing me to staff. And, and we spent many months, in fact, it was almost a year, it, talking and doing this whole thought exercise of how do I meet clients through lawyers without making anyone feel that they don't have a choice or, you know, we always wanted for everyone to understand that this was a completely voluntary process. But I did, even though I was meeting a lot of kids and a lot of immigrants out in the world, there were so many other ways to meet um, people that I could film. I really wanted to film children who had a competent lawyer because we then, behind the scenes, had many conversations about what was okay to include in a film without jeopardizing their case, without jeopardizing the safety of, of everyone involved. So, um, yeah. And Gracia can tell you more about how she opened up. I mean, she, it wasn't as if I showed up and, and it was an easy thing, nor did Gracia, uh, nor was Gracia very excited about herself being on camera. I'm still Hi, not excited. How are you, for joining us? 
I know you're used to, by this point, you're used to all the cameras. So you're a pro now. Um, no, it was definitely a long process. Um, getting to know Allie and getting to know the family and introducing them. Yeah. What, what really surprised me is not only are you legally representing the families, but advocating for them, but I also saw that you became a mentor to them. You were like that one person they trusted um, that helped them navigate such a complicated process and such an emotional process for them as well as a family. Because I, as Ali teased a little bit a while ago, is it's very subjective and it's a very different outcome for each sibling within the same family. So for you, what does it mean to you to be able to do this for a living, number one, and you know, provide this service to the community um, and also be able to change and save these, these lives pretty much? Yeah, it's a huge privilege to be able to do this kind of work. Um, you know, I went to law school so that I could give back to the community. And in Miami, that work definitely revolves around immigration, you know, representing families and children that have already suffered so much only to face, you know, such an adversarial system here. Um, and it's not a trauma informed system. And, um, you know, and our clients, you know, they've been through so much and then they have to meet with the lawyer, open up to us. And these are children. We have to work super hard to build trust, to go through every detail of their story. Um, and then to prepare them to face the government that's trying to deport them. Um, and the government's trying to find, you know, any discrepancy, like, you know, anything that they might say that's inconsistent could be used against them. It's a huge challenge, you know, it's a huge challenge for, um, you know, to build trust with, with people that are so, have been through so much and have so much trauma um, and to face this adversarial system. And I'd say for the attorneys I work with, you know, we don't talk about it that much outside of work, but we also kind of soak in that secondary trauma. Um, but I think it means a lot to all of us because we all realize that we're so fortunate, that we're so lucky, that we can travel, that we can live safely. I mean, beyond just having a safe place to live and not worrying about being killed or not having our parents taken away from us, like we have the freedom to travel and do things that basically that's what we're fighting for in immigration, right? Um, the right to live somewhere where you can, you know, have a free life and, and be safe and well. Wish I, maybe you could help us understand in terms of put it in context, right? Like how high is the demand? How much needed is the service that Catholic Legal Services provides? Because um, many people, you know, maybe assume, oh, but they'll get assigned an attorney or I just wanna, want you to help us understand how important it is uh, to help Catholic Legal Services because they do what and because the demand is so high. Oh, I think you're on I mute. Think, you're on mute, Gracia. I think Gracia's on mute. There we, uh, go. there we go. No, I mean, the need is so tremendous in the community. There are just thousands of children currently that are unrepresented, that are going through, um, that are in deportation proceedings. And even though immigration law has been turned upside down in the past four years, I have to say I'm so proud of that team because we have secured uh, special immigrant juvenile status for almost every child that we've encountered if we've met them at the right time. Um, because a lot of the immigration benefits for children have to happen, like it needs to happen before. And that is so important, the timing of it, right? Because if you, if you, I'll get assigned a case that has already gone the wrong way or been advised, you know, to whatever it might have been. It, it makes a huge difference in the, in the future and the destiny of that child and that family. It's huge. Um, and so I think that we're constantly pivoting and just being creative about how we can find um, immigration relief for every single child that we work with. I mean, my entire office is dedicated to helping find immigration relief for every single person that we meet, or to give information, however we can use our resources because our resources are so limited. Um, and frankly, if we had more resources and which would be unrestricted funding, you know, I could hire so many more attorneys because we have so many applications from people that wanna work for us and do this kind of work. Um, and even if you're an attorney in the community and you know, you want to help and take a case pro bono, we would be happy to mentor you. So 
Um, we can share my email address in the chat if anybody would like to reach out to me. I'd be happy to talk further or to place a case with them or um, give them information because, yeah, we have this tremendous need and we could basically represent all of the children in deportation proceedings if we had the manpower. And the manpower is directly related to the funding. So let's, let's emphasize one more time. So Miami has among the country's highest number of children in need of legal representation, second only to Dallas and Texas. So you can only imagine the demand and the need for this. Um, we're gonna go ahead and welcome now Fernando. I don't know if he's ready. Vamos a invitar a Fernando. Fernando is, I wanna say one of the protagonists of this documentary. Um, he's one of the siblings, one of the four siblings um, that Ali shared with and documented. Um, their journey once, well, their, I guess, legal journey here in the States once they arrive, and also the emotional um, challenges that his mother, because I really empathize with his mother for me, I think was another hero, because she stayed strong and she had to be balanced with among all her children and deal with all different age, ages and the way that each of them dealt with the issue at hand. Um, so, Fernando, no sé si puedes unirte a la conversación. Vamos a ver si creo que también el está... el micrófono, Fernando. Sí, hola, ¿cómo está? Bueno, Fernando, hola, bienvenido, buenas noches, qué gusto verte buenas otra noche, vez. Buenas noches, gracias. Bueno, estamos aquí conversando y queríamos hacer énfasis, obviamente, en la importancia, y, y tú puedes ser, obviamente, el, compartir tu testimonio. ¿Qué tan importante fue tu relación con la abogada? Eh, ¿Y por qué es tan importante que estos niños no reciban esa asesoría legal, esa ayuda legal? Para ti. So I just asked Fernando, what, how important was his relationship with his attorney and why was it so important for these children to have obtained that legal representation? Cuéntanos, Fernando. Bueno, para mí la importancia que fue para que ella me, me, me explicara cómo es el proceso de, de lo que uno va a pasar en todo, en todo para poder recibir papeles fue, fue algo maravilloso porque uno viene aquí sin saber nada viene como ciego pues sin saber las leyes sin saber el, el cómo se, cómo seguir los pasos para para tener una buena un, un buen camino para seguir ellos como que lo, 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 lo guían para seguir los pasos bien y tener un buen camino de seguir para no tener problemas porque uno en mi país pues todo era diferente a como es aquí ahora Y ella me guió en todo eso para hacer las leyes, para hacer todo bien, para no tener problemas. Fernanda said that, you know, she, the attorney in this case, pretty much guided them. You know, it was a completely different system how things were done in his country, in Honduras. And she kind of became like that guy to help them explain and, and advise him during the process. Fernando, también vemos, eh, por ejemplo, tus hermanos que eran, mucho, que eran menores que tú eh, y también que pasaron por... A mí me impresionó mucho que niños a esa edad se tienen que enfrentar a un abogado, un juez. Eh, como hermano mayor, ¿cómo fue para ti ver a tus hermanitos? O explícanos, ¿no? ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo fue el proceso para ellos también y qué fue lo más difícil para ellos? So I asked Fernando, his younger brother, siblings, what was, how was the process for them, you know, having to encounter and go through this legal process at such a young age? Cuéntanos sobre la experiencia de tus hermanitos. Sí, como, como por ejemplo, por, para mí fue algo muy 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 raro muy diferente a lo, a lo nuestro y a mí me daba no sé qué porque mis hermanos a veces se ponían a llorar o el más pequeño se ponía a llorar y me daba no sé qué verlo así porque son cosas diferentes que uno que uno que uno no, vive aquí también no porque es mucha presión mucha presión exacto porque todo lo, lo del camino y también y venir aquí porque hay personas con un carácter súper diferente y mis hermanos, uno que es un poco tímido para hablar y ver el carácter de otras personas es muy difícil y también ver a mis hermanos que también tocaba pasar de les tocaba pasar eso fue algo súper difícil ver y, y me dolía bastante verlos así porque aparte que veníamos sufriendo tocaba venir a, a sufrir un poco más aquí eh, Ali le voy a dejar que join us again and and for you to share a little bit of what it was to spend time with Fernando and his family uh, and how did you gain your trust, you know, for you to be able to document paper children? Um, 
So it was definitely a process. Fernando, perdón, tú luego te voy a traducir todo lo que voy a, no, no voy a hablar de ustedes, <laughs> pero en inglés. No, no, sabe. Um, pero me alegro verte. Ok, gracias. Eh, me, están pre me está preguntando Pamela del proceso de ganar ganarme la confianza de ustedes. It, it was all, initially it was through Karen, um, Fernando's mother who you were mentioning earlier. She's, you know, like a good matriarch, access to that family um, is completely dependent on, on gaining Karen's trust and love. She was remarkably open from very early on. In fact, it was interesting because Gracia, when I started speaking to many different attorneys at Catholic Legal Services, and as I mentioned, lawyers at other organizations, and, but Gracia said, you know, I have this family and I actually think they might be very open and might understand the mission. Um, and frankly, initially, I was also speaking to some other children who had been so heavily targeted by the gangs. I mean, this family was singled out by armed groups and, and you'll see in the film, you know, unfortunately, many family members were mur murdered over the course of making the film. But sadly, I heard much more gruesome stories from a few other children where we couldn't include them in a film because it was just too dangerous. And so part of it too was this family, there was a risk, but, but it was a balanced risk, right? It was something that we all felt, including the family, comfortable. And we did do a lot in the edit room to remove a lot of personal details, um, use a pseudonym whenever we talk about them in the media. But back to your original question, um, it was time, you know, I, I was physically allowed into the home very quickly, but that doesn't mean that, you know, that facade came down. And, and for sure, the person for whom that took the longest emotionally was Fernando, but it wasn't specific, I don't think, just to the camera. I think that some of what you were alluding to before was just, is that it's not only the emotional weight of constantly being in limbo, but being the eldest who was responsible for the well-being and the safety of his younger siblings from such a young age. When Fernando was 12, his mother had to leave Honduras in order to earn enough money to, to educate her children and mostly feed them. Because while they lived at the time in a peaceful village, it was very, very poor. And unfortunately, that was the only out that she could figure out. And it was a very hard decision. You know, we've spoken about it many times, what that was like to leave her kids. But the result was that Fernando, 12 years old, was in charge of his five-year-old brother and his two other siblings. So I've learned a lot in this process, not only through this family, but in speaking with so many other advocates. And actually, we've begun to do work through the film with the American Psychological Association, which we're going to dig more and more into our impact campaign and talking about the trauma and kind of the holistic right. um, needs of these children, not just their legal needs. but when you learn that your mechanism of defense of survival is to be stoic is to be tough is to not show fear it's very hard to unlearn that particularly in a whole new country in a different language uh, in this very adversarial process so going full circle that lawyer is is so fundamental and i think one thing that i failed to answer earlier when you were asking me part of what really struck me the most about these different lawyers spending time with them working on the film is how much they themselves, they not only provide so much for these families, but emotionally they take on a lot. And so for me, supporting Catholic Legal Services is not is not only about supporting the families that they're representing, but supporting these lawyers who, um, who are doing some really, really, really tough work. Uh, that takes an emotional toll. So let's talk with Grisha a little bit um, again, who, who's our Catholic kind of Legal Service um, attorney. And let me give some more uh, numbers um, just to put it in perspective for everyone. So more than 450,000 minors in this country have pending immigration cases. Of the 41,838 children with pending cases in Miami Immigration Court, listen to this, 60%, which is 25,000 children, have no legal representation. Um, so the demand is definitely there. They need the funds so they'd be able to help more children. Um, and Gracia, if you could join me now and 
and and let's highlight a little bit of the because it's not only like you say helping them navigate a legal system and kind of sitting with your you know with a regular legal client this is someone who has already been these are families who have already mostly gone through the separation right because most of the times these parents come before um, and that was in my case too my mother came before and three years later now navigating the legal system we finally were able to reunite here in miami but you know how do you advise a mother not only from a legal spirit but also from a personal emotional perspective that the outcomes may be different for all her children well <laughs> i mean we can't make any guarantees right with our um with our clients but what we try to do is we just try to like what i find with my clients is that um it's so hard to to sort of look at the just the step ahead of them you know they're looking at the the big picture of you know they want to have their green card or they want their work permit or they want the whole problem resolved because it's a huge problem from start to finish to to get their case resolved and i'm just constantly working with my clients to remind them that we're going to just worry about one step at a time that we're going to worry about what we're going to do today or our next hearing in court or the application that we're gonna file and that we're gonna do it to the best of our ability and that I'm always gonna be there with them to you know, answer their questions and to review everything and that you know, I try to um, meet my clients where they are, you know, both emotionally and with whatever their you know, levels of education might be or whatever their experiences are so that they feel as comfortable as possible, like opening up to me and um, and feeling like, okay, they're in good hands, but I can never make any guarantees about, you know, what's going to happen, especially the past four years. Um, a lot of the, you know, the laws that we were clinging to that could help our clients were undone. So it's been very challenging. And yeah, I mean, it's extremely emotionally draining for everybody. You know, it's emotionally draining for my staff, um, especially because attorneys, you know, they want to win. <laughs> <laughs> they also just want to win in court. Um, and, and it's such an important, you know, it's not, this is life and death. This isn't fighting over money. This is actually, you know, if people are removed to their countries, which sometimes our clients do end up detained and do end up being deported. I mean, that is literally life and death. So I try not to, um, I don't want to discourage my clients. I don't want them to feel that, that they're not going to win their case. Um, but I just try to keep it like one day at a time. Um, Ali, we want to, we want to ask Fernando to join us again, and maybe you could have him share something without giving obviously away the ending of the film, but maybe something that he also learned about the system or, you know, cause I, I feel like every time the Karen or Fernando, one of the siblings received a call from Grace or one of their attorneys, it was like, it was going to change, you know, their destiny. Um, so I don't know if you could go ahead and ask Fernando um, well, kind of to, to maybe narrate a little bit of, of that experience of those emotions that you documented every time they had that communication or they had that meeting with their attorney to either prep for a hearing or um, just while she explained, you know, what was next in the procedure. Uh, for me, those were the most nerve wracking moments of the documentary. Fernando, me parece que ya estás aprendiendo inglés porque encendiste la cámara cuando estaba hablando. Cierto, ya Fernando. Eh, si quieres quitar el, eh, encender el micrófono, te vamos a hacer una pregunta. Ya está Fernando Ali, creo. Ya, yeah. ok. Eh, pues nada, Pamela estaba preguntando, estaba listando la pregunta en inglés para... Estábamos pensando... ¿Cómo para ti eran los momentos de anticipación o, o siguen siendo los momentos de anticipación en los momentos claves del de caso? Por ejemplo, la noche antes de, de la corte, de un día a la corte, ¿cómo, cómo lo pasas? Súper fatal. Me lo paso súper fatal porque no sé lo que va a pasar y, y siempre súper nervioso que ni dormir casi puedo. Tal vez me vengo durmiendo a las 4 de la mañana porque me pongo nervioso siempre por eso, porque no sé lo que va a pasar y, y nunca, a veces voy normal porque nunca me dan una respuesta, siempre me la, siempre sigue, sigue, sigue y nunca me dan algo para, para algo, algo que me diga pues que sí me lo van a dar o no me lo van a dar, pero sí lo paso súper mal esa noche, lo paso súper mal. 
¿Qué tan importante ha sido, Fernando, para ti tener a, a Gracia, a los abogados disponibles, que te expliquen el proceso, que te ayuden ¿no? con todo, durante todo este tiempo y también que han ayudado a tus hermanos? Para muchos niños que no tienen ¿no? esa representación y que necesitan ayuda legal, eh, ¿qué ha significado para ti tener acceso ¿no? a Gracia de los abogados? Bueno, para mí significa, se, significa mucho para mí, porque como, para mí siento que es como una familia que lo, que lo apoya en todo a uno. Así lo siento yo, como una familia que siempre lo están apoyando siempre y con la mejor manera. So I think that's a, a great way to, to sum it up. So for now, I just asked Fernando, you know, how important was it for you? Or what did it feel like to have access to Gracia and to her team and to the legal representations that him and his siblings had? And he said that he just felt like a family, like having that family support um, during a very difficult and stressful procedure that continues, you know, as without giving away, I think the documentary, there's a lot of limbo that these um, children go through and, and that's what we're trying to help and do something about tonight. So I don't know if you have some closing words, Ali, before we sign off or Randy, I don't know if you're still connected um, before we end the night. And the importance for everyone to give, especially during Give Miami, remember it's givemiami.org slash Miami, which is Catholic, um, Legal Services. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and open the mic. Gracias, Fernando, por acompañarnos esta noche, por tu testimonio. Y, y realmente, si Ali puede decir algo, Ali, you could say some closing words, and then Randy, just to finalize. Gracias. Gracias, Fernando. And I also wanted to share that, in addition to Fernando, more of the family was scheduled to attend. They were very excited to attend, but they're all... Um, working very hard and unfortunately we're working late tonight but i think part of picking up on what fernando was saying is very true that the this family but every client that i've observed at catholic legal services they really think of this as a very personal and possibly other than their family it is the most <laughs> fundamental relationship that they rely on in their life once they arrive here in the u.s so i encourage everyone it's not just um you know the circle of people who are here, but if we can really spread the word, Give Miami Day is officially tomorrow, so this is our kickoff. And really what we were hoping to do today was to use this as a catalyst to engage in the conversation about why this organization is worthy. There's so many you know, causes and issues out there. But you know, I feel strongly that being in Miami, a community of immigrants, also so many of us rely on the labor of many of these families who are coming here, the parents of many of these kids. And it's another way to give back to all these people who support us in our everyday lives. So I encourage you and please spread the word. Tomorrow's the big day, but you can begin giving as of right now up until midnight tomorrow. So please help us spread the word. If you get on social media, you are welcome to repost anything. We're all over Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram through Catholic Legal Services. If you look us up, just put Catholic Legal Services Miami. We'll put the link here. Um, and I'm going to pass it on to Randy, but thank you, Pamela. Lovely as always. Guys, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I am just very moved and touched by all of the work that you guys did in preparing this. This was beautiful. Thank you so much, Ali, and for your help, your friendship throughout the years. I, I want to leave very much on a note of optimism and hope. Um, I think Miami is a great example of a city of immigrants that has been transformed by all of the talent that has come to us. And we need to remember that image and we need to sort of redefine what we're dealing with. I really believe that we are not looking at a problem that has to be solved, but as people who need to be helped. And we, when we start thinking like that, I think the help will come, but we need your resources. I'm very optimistic that we're going to get through this. I've been doing this a long time and I've seen many waves of people come and eventually they make it, eventually they integrate into our system, eventually they then become the ones we'll reach out to and ask for their help, the next generation to come. So I urge you all to help us persevere, help us make this future possible by providing us with the resources and you can do that tomorrow. So thank you everyone. Good night.